You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. In school, they never gave me a really big chance. I mean, some teachers said to me, you're never going to be like successful in life and you're never going to get a wife, you're never going to move out of your house. And I was like, it played on my mind for a long time. I was like, what am I going to do? You know, I don't have any grades in school. I've left school, fourth year, working with my brother-in-law and just dropped out of that as well. So I take my hat off to you, and especially people watching this, they'll take inspiration that, don't matter if you get labelled, you can do what the fuck you want. 100%. You can make changes, you can kick on, you can strive to keep constantly betting yourself. We're getting checkups, we're looking after our bodies, we're not idiots, you know, I'm not a... I'm not going to do this for another 20 years, that's not my goal. I want to do this maybe for another couple of years, capitalise as much as I can. Tom and I win World's Strongest Man, boom, right, that's it. You know, you look at Eddie Hall, he won at one time. He pushed his body to the absolute limit. I mean, I was there when he won it, and it was like, <laughs> yeah, it was like on the edge of dying, basically. Um, would we be willing to do that? I, I would. Because I've seen videos, who was it who shit themselves? Was it you? Doing the Atlas Stone? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Even now, like, I, I get... I, like you say, I'm the emotional one, you know, so I, I probably cry every day about mum. You know, every day I, I kind of, there's certain things that I remember of her. That's like sunflowers, you know, that's why we got sunflowers and stuff. That that was mum's favourite flowers. So it's, but it's, I also cry, but I cry because I'm sad, but also because she inspires me all the time. You know, it's having that, someone said to me, it was a, a therapist, I, I saw, see, it's still see a therapist, but it's, um, just because they're gone doesn't mean that relationship's gone. And I was working down in Newcastle at the time, and I was just on the way to the gym, and Mum phoned me, and I knew what the phone call was going to be. You know, I knew it was going to be, she's got cancer and it's terminal. Just in my head, I just knew it, I just fucking knew it. And, and um, she told me, and I had to pull over at the side, and I was just like, Prrr. I couldn't believe it. You know, six, she had six months to live. So I drove home that night from Newcastle, I can't do this, so I went home and... Um, I went down to the doctor's surgery to see the doctor that misdiagnosed my mum, and I would have killed him. I would have, like, uh, point blank, I would have killed him if he was there. Um, I, I was shouting, I said to the receptionist, I need to see this doctor. And she says, why? I says, well, he's just murdered my mum because he's misdiagnosed her for a year. Boom, we're on. Hey. And today's guest, we've got the strongest brothers on the planet. Tom and Luke, how are you, brother? Yeah, good man yourself. Good yeah. Thanks for having us good on. Good to see you. Yeah, appreciate it. Yes. He's a fly in the last couple of years. Obviously, Scotland's strongest men. And now, second in the world's. The first brothers ever to be top 10, am I correct? That's right, uh, yeah. That was our claim to 20, fame. 2019. 2019. Yeah. Phenomenal achievement. Appreciate Two boys it. from the Highlands just doing their thing. And it shows that from a small village that... Anything can be achievable, especially for upcoming uh, power lifters or whatever. You yes, are doing it. Definitely. Still young, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> one of so the yeah. baby of the sports. Stars, yeah. So. <laughs> no, phenomenal achievement. It's an absolute honour to be sitting across from these guys. I see all you up the mountains as well, doing the cold water stuff. Massive Wim Hof fans, including myself. And yeah. we'll touch on all that shit. But I always go back to the start of my guess. Kind of where up and grew up, how it all began. We'll start with yourself, Luke. Yeah, so I mean, I was, I was right into football and that when I was younger. I was always quite sporty and stuff. And um, our grandparents, our dad's grandparents, they came across in a war from Germany and Poland. So our oma, our granny was German, our granddad opa was Polish. And all I remember uh, of my opa when I was younger was this big, strong, like just a typical man. Do you know, what I mean? he was working the peat fields. He was like employed a lot of guys doing that and anytime I seen him he just looked powerful and then go to dad as well dad was a dad's a big guy he was kind of over six foot and for me just in my head when I was younger I just when I was like 12 13 I just wanted to lift weights I just seen these guys <laughs> sounds a bit weird like I used to you know, look at the magazines and see these big strong men and think fuck me man I want to be like that and when I turned 16 I went straight to the gym and just started lifting. I just loved it, that feeling of kind of, uh, 
for me, it was like improvement every day. I could always improve. So I'd go and do bicep curls. And I could always do one more and, and bench press and all that kind of good stuff. And, um, and then it was just being from the Highlands for me, watching, obviously, William Wallace, Braveheart, bullshit kind of thing. But having that vision of like the modern day kind of Highland warrior kind of thing. Um, but I don't think, because like for me back then, there wasn't that many big strong men in Scotland to look up to as such and it was always I was always questioning why why we as a nation why don't we have these big warriors that we did have when when you know William Wallace and that was there and that's that's how I kind of in my head that's what really got stuck into my head I wanted to be this kind of strong man and really kept pushing on and I think my first competition was I was 27 when I first started competing so I was quite late into it it wasn't like a an instant thing. It wasn't a flash in the pan. So I had to really work hard and um, and just loved it, man. It was just from that first wee competition I did in Inverness. Um, it was a deadlift competition. We had maybe it was maybe like ten or fifteen people yeah, watching. Yeah. And like from the instant, it was like I was ripping my shirt off, <laughs> and that, that kind of that buzz I got from competing in front of a crowd. And I think you touched it being from a wee village. It's you don't have that many people there. We didn't have like a big school or a, um, a lot of like people in the town in the village. So as soon as you start going to competing in front of ten thousand people, I was just buzzing, man, and I was just hooked. That kind of adrenaline just took me, and then yeah, that was it. Just thankfully, my face fit. Um, I've kind of fitted into the sport. The promoters seemed to get on well with me. I got on well with them, um, and yeah, just started to kind of grow and grow and grow and. Mm -hmm. And here we are now, yeah. you know, talking to yourself. Yeah, lucky bastards, eh? <laughs> yeah, um, how, did, how did that affect you then, Tom, seeing your big brother doing that? Did that enhance you? Did that help you a lot? Or were you thinking, I want to beat him straight away? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, obviously when I was younger as well, I was football, you know, football daft, anything like that. You know, it's Glasgow Rangers when I grew up all through my life. And then when Luke started the gym and started kind of the straw man, I, I thought I'm never, ever going to do this sport like... I was like a skinny Peter Crouch, you know, Scottish version of that. So I was just like, it's not for me, you know. And then I think I was 13, I was watching it on TV, you know, the Marius Puskanovskis, the Derek Poundstones, those were the physiques. They had like the abs. And then I seen other strawmen that were the guts. And I was like, these guys aren't athletes, you know, like fat guys, mm -hmm. <laughs> smoking fags and stuff, uh, lifting weights. So I was like, you know, I wasn't really into that. And then, I think it was like 15, Luke said, oh, come to the gym with me. So I started at my local gym and yeah, I mean, I hated every kind of minute of it. I mean, the pain I was feeling the next day, girls lifting more than me, other people lifting more than me. <laughs> the, the, you know, the muscles of like guys that had been going for five, six years, him just like benching, I was like benching 140 at the time. I was like benching the, the bar. I was like, how the hell are people doing this? And then I think it was more, when Luke did do his first competition, uh, I went down to support him, and I, it was like the, when these guys were lifting the cars and the logs, and I was seeing it face to face. I was like, "This is different than TV. This is different than just going to the gym, and the crowd as well." Like there was a few thousand there, and seeing Luke do what he was doing, and then I did the fan event. I was just doing some big uh, farmers carry and one that, and I was like, "I'm quite strong," so. <laughs> Went back home, joined a kind of gym in Inverness and kind of took off from there. Luke took me under his wing. A few other boys that are in Inverness took me under their wing as well and kind of just showed me the direction to go in. I mean, had mates that did it, but they went off in the wrong direction. And I just wanted to be like focused on satin, you know, sport was my whole life. And I just wanted to be good at satin, you know, prove that I could do something and to like kind of follow in Luke's footsteps and kind of, I wanted to quit all the time. I mean, I was in the most uncomfortable position in the gym, you know, I hated talking to people, I hated being around people, but to kind of force myself in uncomfortable situations, to follow in Luke's footsteps and then to enter my first competition, I think it was like 18 years old, um, Luke threw me in the deep end as well, I mean, I wasn't allowed to do the junior stuff, it was more the opens and stuff, and <laughs> I remember, I think it was the first one, I came fifth in Scotland, I made Luke win the title, so that again was a special feeling, you know, seeing your brother win the title, me come top five at 18 years old, and then, that was when I was like, yeah, geez, I can be good at this sport. And that's when I went to UK, seen Eddie Hall, and I was like, like this is next level, this now. You know, I'm never going to get near any of him. I thought he was big. And then see Eddie Hall and Lawrence Shalley are like, 
this is just, I was just like fanboying, but for me, it's a buzz as well, you know, that when you lift those weights and you see improvements every day, the, it's like a drug to me, you know, the buzz you get, uh, the adrenaline in your body, it's just unbelievable and yeah. you can't really explain it, but like, I hate, it sounds weird, but I hate doing the like, barbell and dumbbell work. I think that's the most boring thing, but then when you get your hands on a log, Atlas Stones, lifting cars it's like that's a buzz that you know, yeah. any human needs to try did you doubt yourself a lot then Tom did your brother play a massive part on helping you progress yeah 100% all, I, all through school e everything in my life I doubted myself on you know like even kind of being a decent footballer as well I was doubting myself like I didn't couldn't get to the next level wasn't uh, confident enough in, but then Luke was always at my side you know from day one saying you know you can be the next big thing and then again as well but that was again and then I had other athletes as well, like Eddie Hawson, you're going to be the next big thing. But then that got a lot of pressure on me, so I couldn't, like, drill in that pressure good. You know, I was like, oh, Tom's going to be the next big thing. I thought, yeah, I, I'm going to be the next big thing and started getting lazy and not working hard just to think, oh, you know, if Eddie You've Hall's saying it. that already, you know, it's, I must have made yeah. it, yeah. So then I kind of stopped working as hard and then was getting beat at competitions I should have won. And then I was like... I need to kind of get a kick up the arse here and actually, yeah. you know, train to be the best. So I hate labels, but you were is it diagnosed with like Asperger's. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I was diagnosed with Asperger's. What at age? A, a young age. I can't remember roughly. I think it was just when you're in the academy. You just... I think it was before. I think it was I, well uh, through primary school. I was getting tests, mm. but I think it was end of primary school, secondary. But that was a massive hurdle in my life. I mean, like look, going in a night out. Uh, I would be phoning, screaming, like, where are you not going out? I couldn't even go on a bus or, like, I went I went from Invergordon to Fern, which is a 10-minute bus uh, journey, and that was my first time doing that, I think, when I was 13, 14, and it was a massive, massive achievement. And, like, you know, for, that, for other people it's not, but for me it was. And to get past hurdles like that, I kind of, in school they never gave me a really big chance. I mean, some teachers said to me, you're never going to be, like, successful in life and you're never going to get a wife you're never going to move out your house and I was like it played on my mind for a long time I was like what am I going to do you know I don't have any grades in school I've left school fourth year working with my brother-in-law and just dropped out of that as well so then it was like when I said when I got to the gym I was like right, I need to do something in my life and I moved out my house my parents house got myself a girlfriend got married then started getting more successful in the sport and yeah having looked there to kind of push me through it like you know being in the interviews I could like I said I couldn't even I put my head down going <laughs> yeah. say yes or no you know and that was the hard part about strongman physically I knew I was capable of doing stuff and I knew I could do the lifting and stuff but then the interviews before it interviews after the fans I was like Jesus not football I didn't know really expect this to be in a strongman so going from like a car park to 15,000 people that just put me all wrong you know I just could not caught with that in my mind like I said I had to have to look there even after events Luke would have to come out and be like you know your brother did good and I would be like yeah so it's yeah. kind of stuff but yeah I mean I just want to get autism out there you know like yeah I've got a label but I'm not different than anybody else you know and I've proved I'm one of the strongest guys in the world getting successful Luke as well and building a profile that I'm proud of and like yeah. I want to I mean I've worked with a lot of people that were the same as me you know and I'm a big advocate for it and I, I love everything. Yeah, though. phenomenal, mate. I love that. That Even the teachers, I used to listen to a man called Les Brown and he says, people's opinion of you doesn't have to be a reality. Yeah, yeah. And for people telling you this and that, it shows you how strong a character you are. Now, labels, I know people who's got a great life from the outside, got all the money in the world that are committing suicide. You've been labelled with something but you've not let it stop you. You've kept pushing through and I don't know if it was Einstein that says it, but don't let um, your edu your your schooling get in the way of your education. Like yeah, yeah, everybody I'm sees the world it. differently, mm -hmm. and you're fucking second strongest man on the fucking oh that's <laughs> planet Earth, which is a phenomenal <laughs> achievement. So I take my hat off to you, especially people watching us. Will take inspiration that don't matter if you get labelled, you can do what the fuck you want. 100%. You can make changes. You can kick on. You mm -hmm. can strive to keep constantly betting yourself. When you knew your brother was diagnosed with that, did that? Was that another push and incentive to, to, for you to keep training hard when you knew he got the buzz for that? Yeah, man, for sure. I mean, I mean, for me, I'm like a big family guy. You know, I'm the oldest of five siblings, so um, I've got a, a duty, I suppose, in my head to look after them all, even though Tom's six foot eight, second <laughs> strongest man in the world. But, like, mentally, Tom wasn't quite there yet, you know, when he started to come on the scene and stuff. And um, I remember when, when Tom did get diagnosed and stuff, it was mum that, bless mum, geez, oh, she, 
she went through hell and back again, you know, to kind of make it that a lot of teachers just thought Tom was a bad kid, you know, growing up. It wasn't like he didn't have any additional needs. It wasn't it wasn't autism or Asperger's. It was just Tom didn't want to go to school and they weren't they were it was like a fight for mum to kind of take it up to whoever it was she had to deal with. So it was it was it was years she had to do this, you know, and um, then when Tom actually got diagnosed with with Asperger's, it was like a relief almost, you know, it was like, right, okay, now we can get the teachers and uh, the support teachers to help Tom and, and kind of, we can analyse it a little bit more. Um, and that, to, that took a lot of time. So like Tom says, a lot of teachers said, you know, you're not going to do anything. Um, but there is, you know, that's just, I suppose, the stereotypical view maybe that they have of, of people with additional needs. But I mean, um, but for me, yeah, it just, it made me, seeing Tom from a young age kind of, Tom just touching it, getting on a bus from Invergarden to Fair and it's only 10 minutes. But doing that little things, that's what I took an inspiration from. It's like, it was so far out of Tom's comfort zone to do that. But he went and did that and he, he's proven he's breaking down these boundaries. Or I can do stuff by myself. I can do that. I can get a job. I can have a girlfriend. I can do this. I'm going to compete with you. So for me, that's driving me more because Tom's, it's it's a million times harder for Tom to do that than it is for me. I'm okay. I'm I'm, you know, I've got my own issues, but fortunately, I I can speak in front of people. I can go on a bus. I can do all this. This is just things that me and you probably take for granted. Whereas Tom, like I say, it's just a little bit more difficult. So, so then Tom comes more of an inspiration to yourself as well. Yeah, if you're having yeah. a down day, oh. if you're losing a bit of motivation, you see Tom showing up. You're thinking, well, big time, man. He's big making time. moves. Yeah, man, hundred percent. I mean. You can't not, I mean, when I watch Tom train, especially now, how strong Tom is, you know, when you see him with his Atlas stones and stuff, it's such an inspiration. But f for me, it's more of an inspiration that the story that Tom has, the journey that Tom, Tom's been on to get here, there's no one else in our strongman game as successful as Tom with, you know, Asperger's or uh, kind of additional needs. And that's, for me, that's a huge inspiration. It's an inspiration to anyone out there that's watching Tom. You know, it's like, we've said it before, it doesn't matter what people label you as or where you're from. These, those are just kind of, I think that's the, the generation or the world we live in. People are too used to making excuses and stuff, you know, so. Yeah. Whereas... Tom's got all the excuses in the world not to be successful, mm -hmm. just stay in his room, be a recluse, but he's not, he's smashed that boundaries and, I mean, here he is, you don't get him to shut up now, you know? it's just, <laughs> uh, which is awesome, so it's like, I, I'm just so proud to see how, how Tom's evolved into this person that yeah. he is now, man. It's person. phenomenal what you two he's achieving, I know he's a broke world records, which we'll touch on, but you are very well respected in the circuit of other um, bodybuilders and um, strong men mm. and, He's a very well liked, very humble guy. He's come across very Appreciate well educated as well, and even striving towards a very sense. I can see you're the sensitive one. Yeah. Um, but I'll, cry, yeah. <laughs> no, I'll start crying in a minute. <laughs> but it's, it shows that p things can be achieved by your mindset. Your mindset's a powerful tool, no matter what you set it to. Like, I believe I'm the best interviewer on the planet, and yeah. people laugh. People <laughs> say, but I just genuinely believe that. If you don't believe it yourself, nobody else will. There's no point in dumbing yourself down to try and fit into everybody else's boxes. And people say, oh, he's arrogant, he's got ego. Fuck that shit. Like, I'm yeah. not going to stop my beliefs and visions to make you feel any better or make your life feel better. I mm. believe in what I believe in. We've all got one life, we've all got the earth inside is what we can achieve. Anything can be got. Everything is limitless. You guys have set your goals out and you've smacked everyone out the park. You were, is it strong? Were you Scotland strongman five years in a row? Five years in a row. What's yeah. the, the lead up to it? What's the planning to do that? It was, for me, it was quite, it was, it was quite quick. I went from doing um, a, a competition in Inverness, met a, one of my good friends now, Peter, and he's like, why don't we do a, why don't we do Scotland strongest man? I'm like, fuck off, mate. Totally daft. I'm just some dafty, you know, some wee scrawny whatever. And I was working offshore, so I, I was working in the oil and gas industry. And I was working in Hamburg at the time off Scotland's Strongest Man. And so I was I was due to fly back to Edinburgh on the Friday morning from Hamburg. And on the Thursday I was like, fuck. Just doubting myself. You know, I'm like, ah, stupid, what am I doing? Like what what a stupid thing to try and become Scotland's strongest man. I'm 
I've just been training bodybuilding. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even lifting that much and this and that. So finished work at seven, went out in, in the pub. I was drinking till about five o'clock in the morning. My, my flight was at six. And I'm like speaking to the barmaid and she's like, look, look, you must go and pack your, your taxis here in half an hour. I'm like, ah, fuck that. I'm not, I'm done. I don't want to do it. I'm, I'm, and then she's like, no, you've got to do it. You'll, you'll kick yourself. And so I was like, right, fine, fine. I'll do it. Went up, got my bag, got in the taxi, blazing, I was steaming, got to Edinburgh. <laughs> um, I think I had to drive from Edinburgh to Dumfries when Scotland's Strongest Man was held. And we got there on Friday evening, slept, woke up Saturday morning. I was the first one into the, the competition venue. Uh, it was a guy, Stuart Murray, that runs Scotland's Strongest Man. Really nice guy. Introduced myself to him. Hi, Stuart, I'm Luke. He said, hi, Luke, pleased to meet you. Just take a seat. And then all these big fuckers come in, and I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. And I've seen them on TV, you know, I'm like, oh, it's a fucking Ken Nowicki, that's fucking whoever. And and all these guys have competed on TV, and I'm like, oh, this is so stupid. I'm going to make a right twat myself. Long story short, I didn't make a twat myself. I won the first, that first show I did, I won, and I went on to win every show for the next five years. So, you know, we talk about self-doubt, I almost kind of sabotaged my chance by going drinking for almost 12 hours before a competition. But that's because of my head. That's because I was doubting myself and I'm thinking these people are better than me. In reality, they're probably doubting themselves, thinking that everyone's better than them. And you've just got to go and do it and just yeah. don't don't worry about it, really. Just go and have a good time. And that's what I did. And like I say, if I didn't do that competition, I wouldn't be here today, you know, chatting to you and... Mm-hmm. Traveling the world. Yeah, man, it's How it. does that then to win that five times and then your younger brother comes in and wins it? Is that is there a lot of competition between you? Or because I know I've seen your videos when you're constantly backing each other when you're yeah, yeah. no matter what event it is. But then does it because of you want to be a winner? Yeah. So yeah. obviously if you, you you fucking want it with Tom's smiling thinking, yeah, I've got one up in him, but <laughs> you do want to win. How was that then? Did you see him I'm going to knock him off his crown of being Scotland's number one? And do you then think I need to keep putting the pressure on Tom. How does that work to being two brothers in that competition? I mean, uh, uh, when I think you were on your, I was came second, I think, to him twice. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 he won his first three titles. And then I came on and I think it was twice. And I was just like, come on, man, like, third time lucky or something. And then I finally did it. But Luke came second. I think we want to keep the title in the Stoltman household, you know. And mm. that's what we've said for every competition. If we can one or two, you know, first and second every comp, it's coming back home to Invergordon, so we don't care. And uh, mm. I mean, for the last seven years, it's been in the Stoltman household, which is a mental achievement in Scotland. So, yeah. but uh, it was always going to come for Luke, you know, I couldn't let him <laughs> keep get, winning it. But uh. I mean, I, it's, I don't, we don't, uh, I don't think it's a rival either. Like, no. you know, you, you see the videos of how supportive Luke is yeah. shouting at me at, well, the world's just passed and then, vice versa so we always want the best of mm. each other and that's what brings it out on us you know it's if we can just help each other as much as we can and that's what advantage we've got we travel to these comps together and he's like in my corner I'm in his corner mm. whereas nobody else has anybody else so. do you think you could do that Tom if your brother wasn't there no way no, no I mean the biggest example for me I didn't really think much of it until World Strongest Man like that's just past stats when you could hear him on the TV like and I mean I had one bad event and my head went right down. I mean, having him to kind of give me the positive talk and say like, you know, you can still do this, you're still in this comp and then to go through and kind of battle out mm. to the end and him shouting was, <laughs> that's when I knew like, geez, if he wasn't here, I would have probably crumbled at the first hurdle. So 100%, yeah. if it wasn't for Luke, then there wouldn't be like the Stokeman brother, there wouldn't be Tom, there wouldn't be him. So Yeah, amazing. It's, what about, how? what's the training like for, like, we'll start off with the Scotland Strongest Man. Mm. How do you go about pulling cars and throwing up logs and if he's got all that stuff planned? Because I know you worked in oil rigs, obviously yeah. you've went full time now into what you're doing, but how is it hard is it then? Because I'd imagine there'd be a lot of funding then involved to do yeah, that kind of shit. Yeah, it's it's a lot of money, you know. And when when I first started doing Strongman, whatever, that there wasn't anything in the Highlands. There was no Atlas stones, there was no log presses, there was no cars, you know, anything like that. So we, Tom and I kind of basically have, have taken strong man or strong man equipment into the Highlands and kind of, we now got our gym, which we have, it's like fully equipped. We've got log presses, yokes, farmers, full range of Atlas stones. It's, 
it does take a lot of, I mean, I usually quote about a thousand pound a piece of equipment. So say if you need a log, log press, a thousand pound, Atlas stones, a thousand pound. And and if you're buying like a hundred pieces of equipment, you know, it's, it's a lot of money. So it's thankfully with oil and gas, you know, the money that I was earning there was reasonable. It was good. So that helped me finance the, the gym we now have. But that was over... I mean, I was 16 years in oil and gas, so it was a long time. It wasn't just, again, it wasn't just a, a one-year thing. It kind of, that progress and that journey, again, that I keep talking about, it doesn't just happen. And I think that's where Tom and I have that more, like our feet are more on the ground because we appreciate it because I've we've both done that and I've, I've done 16 years in, in some god-awful places working around the world. And, and I really appreciate what I have now, being home, you know, see my wife every night, being able to train with Tom in the gym, having a business, you know, that to me is is such a an amazing feeling, you know, yeah. compared to what it was. So it's yeah, it's it's there there is companies and thankfully now, you know, sponsorship and stuff, people send up um equipment to us, but um it's it's not cheap, but it's just it's invested in yourself. So, you know, this is our business, this is our our gym is our office, so we need to have so say you're buying you know, an office work has their computers, whatever, and desks and shit like that. We have log presses, Atlas stones, 4,000 kilos worth of weights, whatever else we need, you know, all these specialist bars. Yeah. So it's just investing in ourselves and and, and that's what we need. You yeah, know? it's your life, it's your business. Because I've seen your videos on YouTube, you've got your own YouTube channel as well. We'll plug that straight away. We'll put a link Appreciate in the description that. for Thank people to come across and watch your videos, daily vlogs in the ice. Yeah. yeah. Eating over 10,000 calories a day. How the fuck do you consume that food? Do you struggle or do you enjoy it? Uh, oh. from, food's the hardest part of it all, yeah, 100%. Sure. I mean, uh, well, I've been with a nutritionist called Nathan. Uh, I went on before, I think it was about a year ago. And uh, so before him, I was kind of just doing it myself, you know, chicken, rice, all that basic stuff that, mm. you know. And then when I went to him, that's when I kind of learned, Jesus, I've not been eating him. Up. Like he was... Like, I was 11 eggs in the morning, four bits of bacon, two sausages, a bowl of cereal. I'm like, <laughs> like I thought a bowl of cereal was enough, you know? So mm. then, I mean, not since we're worlds. I mean, I was up 181 kilograms, and it's just bigger comps. So when you're peaking for a comp, the food is unbelievable. Mm. I mean, you're talking, I'm, I think I was peaking at 12,000 calories, uh, burger. But it's not all healthy foods. That's the thing with bodybuilding strongman. We're using calories and carbs to fuel our workout. So we need the burgers. I mean, I eat donuts every day, four a day. It's <laughs> Some people would say that yeah, was actually that's okay. A great, yeah, it's yeah. a great diet. So yeah. I mean like burgers and everything, but yeah, mm. 10 to 12,000, but even like burgers and donuts get sickening after eating them course, every day, mm. seven days a week, you know, but for me, diet is 100% the hardest part. Yeah, because people say you are but eat. So how does that affect you mentally? How does that affect the heart and stuff, the kidneys, the livers with? all the sugars and salt and salts and does that play a massive part yeah, in your sure. mind? I mean, it's, it, 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 the diet gets more severe the closer we get to a competition. So it's, you know, and Tom, that's what we're saying, kind of for the peak, that's when we're on the most severe diet, your 12 eggs, whatever, you know, that higher calorie, but then we'll drop it back after, after the comp. But yeah, we, we get health checkups, we get our blood tests, kind of ECGs done in our hearts and stuff. So, we're in pretty good shape considering, you know, it's not the most, obviously a lot of red meat we eat because it's, it's you know, it gives us a lot more strength. Me personally, I find when I'm eating uh, steaks, kind of anything red meat, my, my energy levels are up as well. My testosterone seems to be more enhanced, should we say. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it is a worry. I mean, we're not, we're not idiots, you know, it's, it's kind of, you're pushing your body to that extreme for our goal, you know, our goal is to be the strongest man in the world. So you have to be prepared to take that, you know, put your body through anything. So if you want to be the fastest man in the world, you're going to put your body through us. Marathon runners, swimmers, you know, all these elite level athletes to be the best in the world, you have to make sacrifices, you know. So it's like yourself, you know, you want, you're the, be the best podcast guy in the world, you're going to have to make sacrifices that's what we're doing at the moment with our bodies so it's just it's weighing up that um risk and re reward kind of ratio and also having kind of support of wives and family you know that, that kind of that, that see that vision 
look, we're getting checkups, we're looking after our bodies, we're not idiots, you know, I'm not a, I'm not going to do this for another 20 years, that's not my goal, I want to do this maybe for another couple of years, capitalise as much as I can, Tom and I win World Strongest Man, boom, right, that's it, you know, you look at Eddie Hall, he won at one time, he pushed his body to the absolute limit, I mean, I was there when he mm. won it, and it was like, <laughs> yeah, it was like on the edge of dying, basically, um, would we be willing to do that? I would, you know, to reach my goal, I'd be willing to push my body to that very limit where I'm like, right, if you do this for one more month, I think that's what Eddie got told, you get do this for one more month, you might die. So it's that's what you've got to do to become the best. So it's live a die mentality. Yeah, man, for sure. And that's that's what we're looking at. Mm. So it's do that and then... Mm-hmm. Then you can worry, then we can concentrate on other things. What you want? The to doors do. are open. Just yeah, they're already opening for you because of the successes we've got. But you know yourself, the doors just everything oh. just tenfold, and that's the plans. It's trying to secure your family's future as well. And for, sure. for people get, will get a better understanding of this. It's not just strong men who everybody thinks that they're fearless. This and that's to get a better understanding <laughs> of the sacrifices, the pain, the misery, like anything in success. There's always mm. sacrifice. There's always we spoke here, let's keep trying to level up. But every time you try to level up, there comes a new wave of hate, there comes a new wave of problems. Yep. It's to keep pushing through the barriers and probably every month you'll think, fuck this, I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to get back in my bed and, and not achieve anything. How you spoke there and support your wives and stuff, how does it affect him seeing he's eating all the time? I'd imagine about a lot of tears, I'd imagine a lot of injuries, a lot of pain, thinking yeah. you're not good enough. How does that affect everyone around you? It's, it's tough, you know what I mean? I... For, for me last year um, not making the final of Worlds like I was a miserable fucker you know coming home and like I felt I like everyone down you know so that was tough for me so Cushy my wife she takes the brunt of that and uh, it, it takes a big person to you know be that punching bag and that's where the support I think of family members of wives partners whatever that that is really so critical sometimes because we're although Tom and I are brothers you know we're still what we touched it we're there to win for ourselves if we don't win we lose ourselves you know that's the thing we lose on our own we win on on our own as well but it's it's a, it's yeah it's tough for them you know it's uh, there's not holidays there's no kind of nights out there's no parties you know it's weddings birthdays we can't really go to them because we've got a train and it does create a lot of kind of problems and uh, i'm not gonna lie you know i our relationships aren't perfect. We have gone through ups and downs and stuff. It's just part of, you know, this is all new to us as well. So it's like, we, you know, where we're from in Invergordon, there's nothing like this. So it's like you're thrust into this semi-limelight and you're now, people are wanting to speak to you. People are wanting to get, you know, your attention and stuff. And it's kind of learning to deal with all that and kind of trying to stay focused, you know, stay focused on that that goal that we have of being the best in the world and providing for our families and making sure that they know that that's what we're doing it for. Yeah, you know, because so. you're world record holders as well. Is that Atlas Stone for you, Tom? Yeah, Atlas Stone for How me. was that? How did that come about? Did you just keep getting stronger and stronger every year? Was that always a goal for you? Uh, I mean, I it wasn't really a goal to do the heaviest one, but uh, it came about, I went got invited to the Arnold's Classic in America. There's like a pro show, but you can go over there to do record breakers, so... Lou went for the log and I was like, I'll give the stone a bash. So I think I had to beat 256, was it? I think it was like that. Yeah. 265. 256. Well, I got 265 in America and then two months later I broke it again and got 286. So yeah, 286 kilogram at the stone. <laughs> That's unbelievable. That was possibly one of the hardest training cycles I've ever gone through in my life. Like with, like you say about the wives, like the sacrifice and, you know, it's, like with me, I'm still young and my wife's young, we're 20, you know, 26 and you want to go out with your mates, you want to have some fun and go on holidays. But like with that, it was pushed her to the side, pushed my family to the side, stayed in my house and was eat, sleep uh, and gym. And that was all I did. But like they find it hard, but then once you do the rewards, you know, it's unbelievable. But like the wife for the support, support for that with the autism and the gym, I mean, it was unbelievable. But yeah, I did... The 286 world record, but then I've got also the longest stone run in the world, 10 stones, did 41 seconds, that was 100 to 200 kilograms, and then the five stone run at Giants Live, Europe's strongest, Britain's strongest yeah, man, Britain's it was 19 yeah. seconds. Oh, it was 16. 
Oh, six, 16, six, I don't want to <laughs> Yeah, so that was, uh, and again, I think that's 100 to 200 as well. So, yeah, I'm known for the Atlas Stones. Uh-huh. It's not, it's not bad phenomenal. at the Stones. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, and so. you've got the log press? Yeah, so I've got the, the British record for the log press, 221 kilos. I got the world record in training, um, but then when I went for the world record, I just missed it by a, a ball here. So it was. What's the difference from doing it in training and then doing it in the arena? Is it a massive difference because of the pressure, more pressure? I, it's I I think it's, it's it can be different as well. It's different equipment. So it's the log press for me, for example. I use my own log press, but in competition, it's yeah. a different log press. So that kind of hinders it. it. Could be the grip. The grip, and it could be like the spacing of the handles, like a few mil off here and there. And you know, when you're lifting that type of weight, you know, a few mil here and there can make all the difference. Mm. So it's just, um, like you say, that added pressure when you've got crowds there. You know, it's you don't want to make a an ass of yourself. Oh, you don't want to fuck up because it's like, oh Jesus, he's he was lifting two hundred and thirty kilos in training, and he's only lifted one hundred and eighty. And doesn't you know? It's like things yeah. like that, but. For me personally, I usually prefer to do it in front of a crowd because I get that adrenaline and um, I thought you just get that boost from the crowd and people are like cheering your name and that, man. It's class, yeah. you know. Because uh, I've seen videos. Who was it who shit themselves? Was it you? Doing the Atlas Stone? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you must because of the pressure. Because oh. people's fucking eyeballs oh. and sh- have, have popped oh. out and legs have broke. That's, a f- that's, just, that's the first time I've ever shit myself doing something. <laughs> I was doing that prep for the world record, but that <laughs> was bad, man. I so. tried to wipe and I had toilet roll on all my hands. <laughs> because you had the sticky, it's like leg wax you put yeah, on, the yeah. stick to the stone. And he's like, oh, look... I shot myself <laughs> and I'm like I'm not coming in the toilet with you mate uh, so he came out with all toilet paper stuck mm. to him and oh, it was <laughs> disgusting aye but it's aye, some pressure the pressure that you put on yourself and your body to extremes but that goes like I watch a lot of David Goggins and the running mm. that he does just 200 mile That's runs and some of them are doing 300 mile now it's unbelievable who's the guy the, the guy who done the mile under four minutes oh, it was never uh, broken as soon as he done it then everybody started smashing it out like yep. your record somebody will blow in your ass trying yeah. to think I want to beat that bastard mm-hmm. so it's constant improvement the bodies and the mindsets Definitely. they are improving human beings are improving a lot of majority are getting weaker mentally but there's people out there pushing the boundaries and you're living proof that he's are pushing them to the new limits and no, it's, it's good to see do you yeah, know what I mean that cool. people from Scotland I don't think Scotland gets the recognition that it deserves there's so many talented people mm, in this sure. country that are smashing it and you are two of them just now that's doing that's it for, for seeing an event is it 10, 10, 10 events in a competition in the world's is it 10? the world's it's 10 uh, yeah, 10 so, to 12 really yeah so. so there's in the world's strongest man you get put in heats initially mm-hmm. so there's five 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 f- uh, five events in the heats the top two of the heats get to go to the final which is then five or six events so in the one day shows it's maybe five or six events that we do but then the world's is over five kind of 10 days or so seven seven days or so, whatever it is it depends on the budget sometimes it's 10 yeah. days sometimes. how many events all in did it just choose from 10 so maybe like 15 different events but they'll choose 10 on the day do you just get to know what's we, coming up yeah we get to know uh, we get to know yeah so we get to train kind of prep uh-huh. the bodies for them mm-hmm. usually 90 percent of the time we do yeah there's, there's a couple of like, sometimes they they'll throw in like a we curveball mystery event yeah a mystery mm-hmm. event or something so then you, you know, just find out when you get out there so it's quite funny a lot of guys get a bit freaked out by these mystery events it's like oh wonder what it could be and it's like nothing that we haven't trained for you know it's like but a lot of guys get very anal over it all like the measurements and this and that and but like it's, you're, the the kind of principles are the same we're picking up stuff and putting it down again that's all we do so if we can't kind of get our brains to work even though we don't know about the events you know we're doing something wrong do you know what I mean it's mm-hmm. like we should be prepared enough if they want to throw in a different event like in Worlds they did they changed one of the events because there was a hurricane on last like at the time and then so we had to do a farmer's hand a farmer's walk which is like a grip event pick it up run but it was for distance mm. so that was like a wee curveball they yeah. threw in and was it inside as well first yeah. time world has been inside you know yeah. we were prepped for outside so mm-hmm. it's just a few different things but usually we know we get like a couple of months kind of notice yeah, and imagine people would panic because I'd imagine anybody ever think it gets a favour of a certain type of um, competitor where they think oh they that's his strongest events they're there 
can that piss you off a bit? Because obviously, if you've got the Atlas Stone, you're going to smash it every time. If you've got the log yeah, pressure, you don't mind the Atlas you know Stone. What I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's. I think you just got to go on with a, an open mind and think. Well, usually everyone's going to, in, in that set of events, that five or six events, someone's going to have a good event, you know, and you've just got to accept that. But as a as an athlete, we should go in there and thinking, right, all those events are good for us. We shouldn't have a weak event, and that's. Your mentality needs to be like that, you know. I, I, me personally, I, I don't care what events are. You know, I've just got to go on and focus and worry about myself. If I'm thinking about other people, oh, that's Eddie Hall's event, that's Adam Bishop's event. I can't, I can't be worrying about that because I can't do anything about what they're going to lift. Mm -hmm. All I can do is control my own. It's quite balanced out as well because everybody's different heights, different weights. So mm -hmm. some not necessarily the, the height would be an advantage for some events. Mm -hmm. These find that as well that is there a certain weight that there's a limit to be maybe 23 stone plus or is that as a people out there who's low 20s and that are smashing it i mean the world's strong as well novakov how old's he like one uh, how old uh, he's 135 k so like 135 so yeah he's, so he's pretty he's, light for yeah for a while uh, yeah. so he's oh, one of the yeah. lightest guys to win it um but anything over 105 kilos in body weight is classed as like heavyweight or open level so then You've got a under one hundred five category, and then there's under nineties, eighties, and so on. So, but if you're over one hundred five kilos, you can compete against someone like Tom's size. So it could be like seventy five kilos between between you in reality. Like, but um, yeah, there's not not really any cut off. There was a guy, Gavin Bolton. He was two hundred and one kilograms. That's like thirty stone or something. He that, big Welsh lad that, that world's unbelievable. Like he was the heaviest world's competitor that ever. Mm. Um, That's too much now. For me personally, for, yeah. These days, I think for this because it's more yeah. endurance now worlds, you know. And I think mm. carrying that much weight, I don't know, man. It yeah. must be it's, it's, it's a lot more dynamic now. You know, it's a lot more functional fitness. Like you doing a lot of running. There's a lot of repetitions now, and it's it's like max distance, max reps. It's not so much as. Like when you see the world's strongest man of old, it was like a lot of max lifts, like so static weights back then. But now it's there is a lot more moving about, and you've got to be ready for that. So mm -hmm. maybe carrying that two hundred plus kilos is kind of yeah. I used to watch the old school ones. I think it was John. Is it John Paul Sigmund? Ah, did but, he die? Yeah, his heart popped or something. Yeah, ah, and then is it Magnussen? Ah, Magnus Ware. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was cool. I remember him. Was he Iceland or Finland? Or? Iceland. Iceland, Iceland yeah. Yeah. Lad. He's. Ah. It's funny how everybody watches a strong man. Yeah, though, it? It's yeah. so popular worldwide. It's um. I think every man thinks they're strong. Yeah. Like people go to the gym with a bench of eighty kilo and a hundred kilo, and they think, right, they walk at me a tight t-shirt and that, thinking, and then I've got used fucking monsters pushing twenty-eight stone. And I'm thinking, fuck me, how small actually am I? Do you know what I mean? Does it make fun. you? I'm not make you like walk about, but do you feel overpowering when you walk into places like constant? There must be constant eyes on you because you go Glasgow. Everybody's quite they're short asses here. Do you know what I mean? The further you got. People yeah, are big, seem to be bigger, but do you see a lot of eyes like fucking size of those boys? Yeah, I think there's a lot of yeah. people intimidated by us before we even talk. Even like in our gym, like we've opened it for the public, but people are scared to come because it's owned by two big guys, and mm -hmm. some woman or guy walks in there like, "Geez, I shouldn't be here," you know. So by f by eye contact, yeah, there's a lot of people, especially like with me, because I'm like six foot eight. Uh -huh. I walk into shops and everyone's just like, who's this guy? Like, <laughs> <"Stop the world." laughs> How yeah. big's your bed? Is it king size? King size, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm growing out of that. So. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask something else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till the cameras are off for that one. What's the planning then for a world strongest man? What is the, the planning for? He's just going to hibernation. Or do you connect with other strong men, or do you just do your own thing? Yeah, so that's what I said earlier. I kind of sat like put everything to the side. So like loads of sacrifice. It's like for me, those kind of competitions, I come first, and like the world's strongest man, the gym comes first. So like the wife will get pushed to the side, the family. You no, know, it's a bad thing, but like you said, to achieve your goals, you need to do that. And for me to be world's strongest man, it has to be twenty four seven. It has to be that graft until mm -hmm. you win it, and that's what. That's what my attitude's right now. You know, I'll go into the gym. I don't care what Luke does out the gym. He can do what he does, but I'll do me, and I'll just do the best I can. And yeah. like it's a hundred percent. It's like what before Wild Strawers, man. That was like an addiction. I never felt like that, and my mind was so focused. I was so focused, and 
every day. It was eating at the same time, recovery at the same time, training at the same time, and it just mm. flows. So that's what yeah. I do. Like I just get obsessed and. That's all you've got to be as obsessed because I know obviously your your mother passed away, which I'm sorry to hear, but mm. that shit can affect you like death. We don't know how to handle death in life. We don't know how, especially being strong men, or people think oh they'll be fine, but we don't know how to handle it. Like people can go in their shell and think mm. fuck this because I've known you've spoken your videos that your mum was at every event. Mm. You never let that make you quit. You've kicked yeah, on. Yeah. You have pushed yourself massively to keep kicking on. How did that? play a massive effect. How did your mum pass, first of all, sorry? Uh, cancer. So My dad was leukaemia. Was it? Uh, big, strong man, seen him deteriorate. It fucks with your mind, but part of me always mm. thought he would survive, even though he got, like, he was in remission. Mm. People, and then he got the phone call, look, come back up to the hospital, and up, look, you've got three months to live. Mm. Part of me is thinking, right, he'll still survive, he'll yep. be okay, always, nah, not yeah, my it's dad. Not yeah, it's not going to happen. Then obviously, when they pass, you think, fuck me, like, I spiralled. My yeah. drug abuse and everything went worse. But for you, you seem to have knuckled down and, and think, fuck it, yeah. I'm going to keep pushing. Did you, did you battle with that to keep going? Yeah, even now, like I, I, get, I get, like you say, I'm the emotional one, you know, so I, I probably cry every day about mum. You know, every day I, I kind of, there's certain things that I remember of her. That's like sunflowers, you know, that's why we got sunflowers and stuff. That, that was mum's favourite flowers. So it's, but it's, I also cry, but I cry because I'm sad, but also because she inspires me all the time. You know, it's having that. Someone said to me, it was a, a therapist. I, I saw, see, it's still see a therapist, but it's um, just because they're gone doesn't mean that relationship's gone. You know, so I can still hear mum in my head. I can still see her driving in front of our house and walking with the dogs. And, you know, that relationship's still there for me with mum. But at the time, it was like, I didn't deal with it. I didn't deal with that grief. Mum passed, and then five days later, I went back to work offshore, away for three weeks offshore in the oil rig, you know, so I didn't deal with that grief. And then that, I spiralled, not necessarily with substances, drugs or alcohol, but in, in my marriage, you know, I kind of spiralled a little bit there. I, I went into, like, resenting my wife for having her family. So... Any time we'd go around to hers, her parents for for dinner, say I would be like I'd create a fight. I didn't want to go because she still had her mum and dad, and like I felt that she didn't understand that, and she was like not getting it. That mum, mum for me was the most important person in my life. She was the person that I went to. I kind of confided in. Um, we built a house, dad's house or mum and dad's house is there, and we're literally twenty seconds walk. So when mum got diagnosed with cancer. We got the land, built a house, because I knew Dad was going to be alone. So, um, fortunately, we, we've got the house there. But it's like you say, it's seen that person that that you think is invincible, and just deteriorate. That that cancer is like it was like in every day is like five hundred plus people die in the UK of cancer. Something or something stupid like that. It's 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 phenomenal. It it it's. And that's it gets me so fucking pissed off that we haven't dealt with that. You know, we're letting people die. That's what I think. Like the doctors. So mum mum was going to the doctors uh early doors and, and she said she had this pain in her chest. So the doctors diagnosed her with I think it was called Bornholm's disease, um, for a year. Um and then we had to go private, get her a CT scan. A year passed by, then we went private. Got the CT scan, tumours everywhere in the body. Um, and I was working down in Newcastle at the time. And I was just on the way to the gym and mum phoned me. And I knew what the phone call was going to be. You know, I knew it was going to be, she's got cancer and it's terminal. Just in my head. I just knew it. I just fucking knew it. And, and um, she told me and I had to pull over at the side and I was just like, Prrr. I couldn't believe it. You know, six, she had six months to live. So I drove home that night from Newcastle. I can't do this. So I went home and um, I went down to the doctor's surgery to see the doctor that misdiagnosed my mum. And I would have killed him. I would have, like, uh, point blank, I would have killed him if he was there. Um, I, I was shouting. I said to the receptionist, I need to see this doctor. And she says, why? I says, well, he's just murdered my mum because he's misdiagnosed her for a year. And, and to me, he doesn't get held accountable. You know, that doctor gets to go home with his family and I'm, I'm wanting to know if he's got that guilt. I don't think he's got that guilt because the medical 
industry and they do great jobs. I'm not slagging them off at all, but if if you get make a mistake in diagnosing someone wrongly for a year, when in that year she could have had treatment, could have survived, she could still be here. You know, you need to be held accountable. And that's, I think that's an issue that we have. Um, so th <laughs> thankfully, I didn't see the doctor, he wasn't there. Um, and like that was our anger, you know, the anger initial. And then that passed and then it was the grief and the sadness and the confusion and, you know, it's all those different things and, and I still haven't dealt with it, you yeah. know, I still... It's to fill the void, which is never going to go away, like the constant working to progress, yeah. to be better. Yeah. It's to kind of escape as well for the method of thinking, yeah, the fucking man. pain that we're thinking. Definitely. Every day's a battle. Like the bitterness towards the doctor and, and as well, and you're thinking, my mum passed because of him. But in life as well, though, everything does happen for reasons. Yep. It's, um, it's to learn to adapt to the pain, mm -hmm. keep kicking on, but that's where it shows you your characters to, to go, okay, you, like, we, I know you just get tattoos and stuff but we still feel a presence there mm. when we're having our down days we'll feel someday okay someday we'll, you have that wee moment like I go up the mountains and I see a robin and I think right that's my dad <laughs> to say that I'm on the right path I don't know if I convince myself or if I hear a song on the radio I think okay I'm still getting guided I, it just makes sense for me yeah. and it can be difficult is that why you went into um, psychologist to get therapy yeah just uh, I kind of I, I, I was struggling because for me, it was like um, people die all the time and no one wants to really listen to my sob story. You know, okay, my mum's died, but so is, you know, your old man, someone else's mum, someone else. And for me, talking about it and going on about it, I felt a little bit kind of self-absorbed and kind of, this is my problems. I didn't, And I thought people were kind of looking at me in a way that I don't really, not, not that people didn't care, but it wasn't really, me talking about it to people wouldn't make it any better. And I was getting judged. I just felt I was getting judged. So me going into therapy and kind of seeing a therapist and talking about it, it gave me that safe place, I guess, to talk about just me and not be judged for talking about me. You know, she was there to help me and kind of make me see things. And, you know, with um, with Kush, with, with my wife, I never saw that I... Um, resented her for having that family. It was the the therapist that picked up on that. It's like, well, you know, you're fighting with Kushi, you're doing these other things. Have you ever thought about that she's still got her family and like it's it's a form of like resentment towards her? And that really hit home with me. I was like, fucking hell, you know what? That makes sense because she doesn't. I don't think she knows what I'm going through, but in reality, she does because she's with me every day. She sees me on my happy times, down times, whatever, and. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a tricky one. We'll yeah, it's it. life, mate. It's, yeah. it's painful, but do you think people treated you differently because you're strong men, as if they'll be fine and not understanding that we're all vulnerable, we're all kind of scared, we're all kind of battling? How did you battle with it, Tom? Yeah, so well, obviously my mum was kind of my biggest person to go to as well, the autism and stuff, because like dad worked away, Luke was away, so every day of my life I was with her. So, and then obviously with the competition, she was there all the time. From day one, she would travel with me. Uh, I mean, I struggled. I list, I kept all my emotions in. I kind of put that face on, you know, and was a happy, like, just went back to my normal life. Didn't believe she was gone. Like Luke said, I seen her every day deteriorating, like, from walking to then being in a bed. I was like, how is this possible, you know? Someone that's out in the garden all the time, you know, fit and not smoking, no drinking, nothing. So to me, I was just like, it's not right. And then, yeah, even my wife, I just couldn't talk to my wife, don't talk to no one, but I kind of just started talking to myself and trying to bring memories back up, would go somewhere myself, you know, in a hill and do like talk, just try and have five minutes to myself. And then again, for me, it was just as hard as kind of saying to someone that had the autism, you know, cause I was like my big kind of biggest person in my life's gone, you know, like what do I do? You know, it's, yeah, I've got Sinead, but I was thinking, should I just quit strong man? Just I didn't want to do nothing, you know? And then, I mean, that's kind of when, I mean, not addiction, but like, I like to have a few drinks. I kind of drank a lot then as well. You know, went out with my missus a lot, but like, it was more just, not just weekends. It was during the week. And then I kind of was like, you know, I need to kind of get my life back on track. My mum wanted me to, you know, get a wife, move up the house and be successful at what I do. And I did the first two, get a wife and uh, moved out the house. And then I, you know, I promised her I would win World Strongest Man 
within four years of doing it and like so the, so then I was just like then I need to get shit together you know and then started talking to Sinead and she understood I mean because like for me like Mother's Days and all that kind of stuff I absolutely hate I don't I know obviously Sinead's still got her uh, mum and you know dad and stuff but like I try and celebrate it now because you know there's still Sinead's still got her mum I try and just she's like my mum figure now you know so uh but my mum's never, obviously, I've got a tattoo of the sunflower that represents her. I uh, put my World Strongest Man trophy up beside her. So I always, like Luke said, think about her. And that's what the gym is for for me. It's like a coping me me mechanism. Yeah, it's yeah. A mechanism, yeah. It's like the lockdown. If we didn't have the gym and I was locked in that house, like, there would be no way I could cope. I mean, there's been some days I'm in the house and not being at the gym, I'm just like, you know, I wish my mum was here she would understand this because obviously you can't tell your wife everything you can't talk to them and like for me it was just really hard especially with the autism I just was like it's my life over you know what do I do but I said it was just another hurdle you know and I kind of had to live with it and then support my dad you know we've got brothers sister we all just came together and kind of was like right you know we need to do something and I'll be successful in life and not just strong men but just be humble and be the guys mm -hmm. who mum and dad brought us up and yeah. I started doing that but yeah hiding my feelings for a while and not letting me like accept that she's gone was the hardest part bro. that's the painful thing but i tell yeah. you what lads man she will be fucking proud yeah. of what he's <laughs> achieving the fact that he's are sitting here <laughs> wearing your heart on your sleeve is unbelievable because like, every christmas and that as well there's a it doesn't matter how well it doesn't matter if you won the worlds mm. you're sitting there still thinking fuck you would give everything up just for that one minute yeah, just well, to sit yeah. at a park bench and have that discussion that like, yep there's Very always cool. something missing and I don't, I don't know if I've dealt with my grief properly with losing so many family members mm. and friends, but I just know working is hard. It kind of takes away the pain. Sitting mm. here talking to you guys for 90 minutes, two hours, I feel free. I had Paul Gascoigne on him and he, he says he played football, he felt free. Mm -hmm. He lost friends and all his, his shit has went through. And this is what you are lifting weights. You just feel free. The yeah, pain's man. away. Definitely. Everything's away. And for what he's are doing, man, is, is brilliant. And like, like I says there, she, she'll be proud, man, for everything sure, he's are achieving. And, but again, you know yourself, there is always that something missing and we do become selfish because as you are strong men, so people will not think you have got feelings or emotions and that could probably be more difficult mm. for you. But you've kicked on. You've kicked on. You've broke world records. Mm. Is it second in the UK as well, Tom? In Britain, yes. Yeah, Britain. Britain. Yeah, yeah. How was that? Uh, that was more hard to take because I, <laughs> uh, I got beat by 0. 0.5. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was I was always improving. Like, I came third in 2019 and then sec second in 2020. And obviously this year, I'm going to win it, no doubt about Good, that. Good, yes. But, uh, yeah. And hopefully Luke can get second. So, mm -hmm. But yeah, that was hard to take because, I mean, losing by a point, two points fine, but 0. 0.5, you're like... How do you lose by 0.5? Uh, is that time or is it I think, yeah, weight or what? I think, I don't really know. I had to I had to win the stones and the guy first had to come like three or four places mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. but he had finished one higher or something and it was 0. 0.5 and I was like, mm -hmm. oh, here we go. But every year you've improved? Yeah, every single year I've kind of done this sport, I've gone up a place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a uh, big pressure this year because I went from fifth to second in the world and now I have to win it to mm -hmm. get better. So. When does the world start this year? It's meant to be end of May, May end June. of May, June. Do you get a pass or anything if you finish top three or do you still got to go through prelims? Yeah, top ten is automatic. So like if the finalists, so the top ten finalists get an automatic. How many compete? Is it 30? Uh, 25 to 30, yeah. And yeah. do you need to do prelims this year? Yeah, so we all have to oh, do sorry, the heats. Yeah, we yeah, all have to go out there and do the heat. So then it's sort of usually this year it was five groups of five. Um, so I think this this year will be the same. So we'll all have to do the the heats. So even Tom and the guy that won at Novikov, Alexi, he'll have to do the the prelims or the heats, and then the top two go to the. Final. How long are the heats before the the main event? Um, it's usually a day. A so day you don't rest. get time to rest. No, no, they're they're tight with the budget like, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so it used to used to have a couple of days rest in between, but obviously last year with COVID and everything, it was kind of crushed in a, kind of a week I think or six days yeah, seven days seven, seven days, days so it's um, but it's good for us because I think we're we perform better in that sense where we don't have to you know waiting around for a couple of days in between events it's like you just you're out there you just want to get on with it and crack on and, and kind of get it done so 
it's, it's probably better having it in a lot of people. I love is it that, that way, yeah. I think. Uh, when you finished, both finished in the top 10 to be the first brothers ever mm. to finish in the top 10, how was that feeling to be the strongest brothers on the planet? I mean, that was possibly better than coming second because that was my, my dad was out there. It was Father's Day, mm. the day off the uh, good. kind of, and then like obviously having the wives there. And like when I was out there, I said, I just want to be in the final, you know, and same with Luke. Mm. And to do it, you know, two brothers doing it and like, it was just uh, it was it spe- I was speechless, man. It was I was I was lost for words. I was just like, you know, I've done what I wanted to do, and then like, next year just push up. But yeah, it was especially having dads yeah, and the wife there, just because like that was just an emotion thing, you know. Like mm. my mum was looking down on us, and yeah. having the whole family there just to celebrate that day was. Is there a lot of emotion yeah. after an event? Yeah, I mean, well, I point out to the sky, you know, because I always like when I'm competing, I always say that's like my mum's there, and I'll always push that extra, like. I literally, I, I couldn't care if I died, you know. Um, mm. If I'm doing an event and I do 10 events and I have a heart attack, I'll die. But like, I always picture my mum there and like she's under the deadlift bar and she just gives me that extra 10%. Yeah. It's 100% with stones as well. I mean, I go to a place with stones that I don't go with any other event and I think that's how I can channel just like, and like a cycle just go so Why fast. do you think that is, that you're so good at the Atlas stones? Uh... I don't to be honest I, I don't even train much with them I mean in my training I'm possibly one of the worst in training mm-hmm. with them uh, <laughs> he's, like, not, he's, uh, not, he's not he's I mean, not I feel I feel like I don't train as hard but I think in competition it's just I don't know what I kind of I mean I don't know if you've seen it I hit myself in the head and like psych myself up in a way that when I do other events I'm more relaxed and chill but I think it might just be the anger like I'm thinking of like my mum being passed mm-hmm. and like my wife and stuff and just I don't know. I just kind of not put pressure. I just lift them up. Like I don't know how. I don't I know how to explain now. I mean, I mean uh, yeah. I think uh, the height for the top half of the stone is beneficial for me, you know, because I just I'm taller than the platform. But it's hard to explain because yeah. like Luke's good at uh, one of the best at Atlas stones as well, and like other boys. But it's just I don't know how I pick them up differently. Uh, there's there's Tom, and then there's the rest of mm-hmm. us. Basically, that's what it is. Like Tom's in a league of his own. But so Tom did the ten Atlas Stone run in Dubai. Was it last year, the year before, whenever it was, oh, yeah, a couple of years ago. And um, so the the previous world record was just over a minute, a minute ten seconds, something like that. Tom then came up and did 40, 40.2 seconds. You know, so he broke a world record by over twenty seconds, which is which is huge. It's like. Like two seconds of stone, which is massive. So like, Tom is, Tom's the Usain Bolt, you know, yeah. of Atlas Stones. Mm-hmm. He's just untouchable, you know. And and every time Tom is maybe too kind of, I don't know, it's just luck, isn't it? Yeah. Well, he says it's luck or it's to the tack. <laughs> no, so it's, it's an art, and it? it's still yeah. a craft. That's because people ask me all the time, like, how, do you get embarrassed about it? No, well, I mean, I know I'm good. Like that's kind of caught you. Like I know I'm good at the event and. Like it's one like if it came to me, and then if I know like you no, know, you're Atlas Stones last event. I know that I'm going to win it. Like that's what I'm always into. But I just don't know how I am not good at it because like when I'm training, if you see me training, I train like everybody else in it. But I think I think I just go in it like I said, like a psycho and just go as fast and hard mm-hmm. as I can. And if it drops, it drops. I don't kind of hold back. I literally just go a hundred percent on it. Like other people will maybe like hesitate a wee bit with it all but I can trust the tacky I've got on and trust myself so it's literally just 100% and yeah yeah, but I am confident with the stones that's like it's always at the last event of every competition you do so I'm like that's my that's yeah, my event bunk, how's right? the come down after it because what goes up must come down imagine with the training like boxers going to 12 week camps and stuff mm. and after the fight it's like a release how's the come down after an event for me I get a major come down mm. <laughs> I mean like, especially after like Worlds, you know, because obviously it was in November and then Christmas came out, but like, I lose a lot of motivation straight afterwards because like, I've achieved what I did there and then you're just like, we don't have a comp for a few months. I just kind of, a major crash. It's all that kind of buzz and adrenaline you've had just goes out your body. Mm. But it's like, instead of like that 10 hour crash, it's like two or three week crash and I'm just getting out of bed at like 10, 11 a.m., eating two meals a day, just no motivation, just drained, just because of all that kind of pre-workout energy you've just used for that whole prep. It just yeah. it hits me hard. Like, but so. I think that's okay to recharge. That's yeah, probably yeah, you recharging yeah. the adrenaline kicks and the pressure to try to be the best. And do you end up losing weight 
after an event because usually a boxer will put yeah. on weight yeah, yeah, because they're strict diet. obviously if you're eating 12,000 calories I'd imagine those calories drop significantly yeah well I mean I went from 180 at Worlds to then after Chris has been like 166 so I dropped quite drastically you know and again that's just with the come down and everything and it just lack of food no motivation but yeah I dropped like 15 kilograms you yeah. know just no that's routine. a lot though yeah is, that, that, I think that was a bit too much just because like I said you know it's just sitting you can't be bored doing nothing you know it's yeah. just you've gone and battered your body for four or five months you want that month where you can just do what you want and not have to mm -hmm. worry about anything you know so. the world's you'd set a target to be world's number one and the strongest man on the planet which is a phenomenal achievement did you set out to win it when you finished second were you going in a frame that i'm feeling good everything's great or were you still battling when you finished second last year um yeah i mean i was when I got to the final, there was good events for me, and uh, the thing that kind of I was confident before the first event, and then when I did that slip in the first event, I dropped the anvil before the keg. Um, I was like, "It's not going to be my day. This is going to be when I kind of crumble." And I, and I was going to like, but then I ended, I still came fifth in that first event. So then, obviously, too, I was like, oh, "Fuck my chances up." You know, I could have won that. I was on track to winning, and then that was when I was like to myself. Nah, I'm going to crumble. But then it was kind of, then again, the Hercules hold is my weakest event by an absolute country mile. Any time that's an event, I'll come last. So I prepped myself for the events around it. And then it was after I, w I won the keg and then I won the law press. I was like sitting in third place. So I was like, um, I was, the stones are coming up. I could win, but the guy that was first had to do something like drastically wrong. So I mean, like I said, I was going there for a podium, uh, third, second or first place. And But when you get second place and you get that close and you're like, you made that one mistake that could change you from being number two to number one, you're like, you know, it was on me. I mean, Novikov, the guy who won it, deserves it. But if I just didn't make that mistake or held on for that two set in longer, I could be sitting here as the best in the world. But it's just one of them things, you know, you don't dwell on it. I went home... Uh, got the trophy and just it's in my back of my head now you know it's it's at my dad's house and I'm not going to look at it until the gold one's there so yeah. that's but the yes, motivation for, I need for 26 you know? years old man it, like, I'd imagine you hit your peak when you're 29 30s 31s I don't mm. know I, I genuinely yes. when, when is it to hit the peak of strong man because I'd imagine you're still growing which is fucking mm. madness to think it's probably like mid 30s mid 30s yeah. when you say your strength but it depends when you start as well so it's Tom's got the next 10 years to oh, be easy, to but there's what is it Brian Shaw's and Brian Shaw's and uh, Sigurdsson's Sidr and Sidr and yeah so you could potentially have five six sitting so in the mantle oh, yeah do you know what I mean and then <laughs> you can just fucking sit and retire with the balls out yeah <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what about yourself? How long do you think you've got left in the game? Look, um, I can't. I, if you've set a mindset for that, or do you think I'm kind of thinking like maybe I don't know. I just look for progression in, in myself. That's all I ask. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm progressing now. I've I gave up offshore this time last year, so I gave up that mm -hmm. profession, as it were. So, really, I'm only a year into it full time. So, um, as long as I'm still progressing, I, I've got goals. I want to I want to win worlds yeah. this man. You know, so mm -hmm. um, I don't know. However long my wife is that hard? Is that hard to think about? Because I had um, Liam Harrison on, mm. uh, who's a uh, Muay Thai fighter yep. and he's in his 30s but there's people in their 40s there's people in their 40s that do the world man yeah. so it's all down to mindset yeah definitely but, but to come up and think I've only got maybe five years left three years left does that can that affect you? it's it affects me more in a positive way I think because I look back to think right well I started at 27 how far I've come on and, and I'm still progressing and I'm progressing a lot more than some of the younger guys so I know I've still got loads in, in the tank mm. but for me I'm quite confident in my own ability so last year I think it was just a combination of I put a lot of emphasis into trying to get the log press world record and that was like that took a lot out of my body and um, maybe I wasn't prepared uh, as well as I should have been but this year you know we talk about what what's the prep for world strongest man my prep starting now you know this is this is my, since world strongest man last year stopped my prep for this year has started you know so it's it's that continual kind of preparation for it you know that's the biggest competition in our in our season so I mean I look at Tom uh, Novikov that's won it before 
um, Brian Shaw. I mean, there's great athletes, amazing like athletes, but we've both beat these guys before, you know, so there's no reason in any given day why I couldn't beat anyone else yeah. in the world. That's Yeah, so if you see Tom finishing second and you're training with each other and you're beating him, that must give you the incentive oh, that, OK, time. well, why can I not be world champion? 100%, man, yeah. I mean, we've got a... A, a kind of added kind of extra over every, anyone else in the world I'm training like we get a train with each other two of the top strong men in the world we have that every training session so like you say Tom's the second best strongest man in the world and I'm getting to train with him so if I'm keeping up, up with him up with him then I'm you know I'm there I'm mm -hmm. there thereabouts and, and usually look, training's training but it's what you do in the competition obviously that matters but it gives you a good insight into how, how things yeah. will go. To be top 10 strongest men on the planet is a phenomenal achievement. How did that affect you when you never made the finals last year? It was it was tough, you know, it was um, it was, it was just a tough one. The, the kind of events I got, I kind of felt a bit like I was kind of fucked over a wee bit. I was like, fucking hell, I'm, I didn't get log press in my group. I'm like, well, that's weird. I'm the best log press in the world. Surely you'd have given me mm -hmm. a shot. Normally, you know, I'd think I'd get squat. They give me deadlift, which is isn't, a, and it's just excuses. But um, I should have been more prepared. That's it. Long, long and simple answer is that me personally, I wasn't as prepared as I should have been. I can assume that I would get log press and squat. Didn't hit the dumbbell as hard as I should. Didn't hit my deadlift as hard as I should. So that was me that kind of fucked up there. You know, that was my own. I'm quite critical of myself and and how I prepare for things. And if I don't prepare as well as I should have done. Um, that's on me, but it was tough, you know, coming back home, especially after Tom did so well. You know, everyone's buzzing for Tom, second yeah. strongest. But oh, mm -hmm. oh, well done, Luke. You did shite, but sorry. Right, you know? <laughs> so it's, it, it was kind of, it was a bit of a kick in the dick, you know, because it's it's tough and people don't see that. And I'm not taking any away from Tom because I was buzzing, I was in tears the whole time watching yeah. Tom. So happy for him, and still am, you know. And I watch it back, I, I get emotional watching it back, mm -hmm. even talking about it. I'm so happy, but. In my own self, I was very disappointed in my performance, and yeah. it just gives me that bigger fire now this See, year. See, that can be hard though, even though he's a training with he's a good, two of the strongest men on the planet training with each other. The positives of that, but there's also the downfall mm. when you should be celebrating being sent. There'd been a part of you thinking you're gutted for your brother, so you can't really enjoy it as much, even though you're buzzing for your brother. You're still thinking, bastard. Mm, I wish it was one. me, kind of. Oh, yeah, him, so it's, a, it's a constant, so I'd imagine it would be difficult. You do the ice um, fairy play, same as myself, we're in mm. the icy waters. Why do you do that for people who don't know? I mean, uh, obviously there's a mental health, which Luke will probably talk about, but the autism for me as well, like it's uh, obviously with these hard times of lockdown, people like Asperger's need a routine and uh, need the same thing every day and need something to kind of, well, like escape from these kind of times. You know, you're locked in your house and, well, I, I did it... Uh, I started it for like the world straw, like the recovery and hot and cold in the gym, but to do it in the sea and like going to locks really just makes me escape from kind of the life we're in right now and just takes me to like a different world. You know, you're like the buzz. As soon as you go in there, everything in your body just like lights up and you're like, mm. this is like your eyes ping open. It's like the best drug you can take. So for me, it's like, and another one like the gym, it's an escape mechanism. You know, I kind of just, when I'm not at the gym, I can go and go on a sea for 15, 20 minutes and just enjoy life. And it's just like, wow, this is unbelievable. So that's why I do. I just think it makes you so positive. You know, it makes you, your day, if you do it in the morning, it starts your day right. Positive energy that you get after that as well. I mean, like look, doing it's changed people's lives and you can see that it's when you take eight or nine people who are there, they're a bit depressed in the morning. As soon as they're out of there, the positivity they have is unbelievable. And, I think that's a massive thing, and especially today, you know, the mental health and the positivity of people, that needs to come together. And uh, cold water therapy is 100% the easiest thing, and possibly it's free nature, mm. you know, you can do it anytime you want, so it's unbelievable. Yeah, definitely, because mm. we're cavemen. We mm. live in luxury. Heated oh, yeah. seats and heated house and Disgusting. jacuzzis. Oh, and yep. When you get into cold water, it's like a, 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 like a switch mm. flips. Mm. You go, wow. And then the buzz after it, I've been getting tired actually after it, I've been doing it the last couple of weeks, mm. but it's the feeling after it, it kind of balances everything out, the health benefits from it mentally, physically. Um, do you think it changes your body shape a bit? 
we, not me personally. I, I, I don't. But one of our friends, he was my best man at a wedding, Big Lewis. Um, he kind of suffered a wee bit of or drinking and whatever else, you know, a bit of addiction mm-hmm. stuff. So on the 27th of December, so Tom and I have been doing it for a couple of years now, but on the 27th of December, I said to him, right, let's get together, go out in the sea. He's like, right, right, yeah, buzzing, buzzing, right, no worries. So we get out and um, I'll get to the body sh- changing shape, sorry. Um, but he's, he's like, right, right, we got there and we went out. And we're chanting in the sea. We're ooh, ha, 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 all this, and it, and it wasn't. It, it wasn't like we didn't think about it. Just what came naturally to us, you know. And and since then we've done it every day since. And and Lewis has actually lost. He sent me a message down one hundred twenty-five. I think he's lost about nine kilos. And I think that is a lot to do with the cold water <coughs> as well. You know, he hasn't necessarily changed an awful lot. He's gone a bit more walking and stuff, but. In four weeks, he lost eight kilos, and he did cold water every day. I'm not saying cold water will make you lose all mm-hmm. this weight, but I think it does something to you. I don't know the science behind yeah, it. Yeah, I think it's medical. It's proven that it, you can lose weight from it, yeah. change, and it's all to do mentally. Because in life, when we hit an obstacle, we just want to turn away and run. Mm. But if you actually just breathe, mm. adapt to it, you realise that wait a minute, because people have survived 100 percent of their worst days. People are a lot stronger than what they think and yep. when you get into cold water the first thing you want to do is run exactly. you want to get your towel around just yep. get the heating on in the car but if you actually just breathe adapt you understand wait a minute ma'am, you become stronger to things so when you do hit obstacles 100%. in life you realise it's actually fuck all I can sit in icy baths yep. for 5-10 minutes yeah. I ain't going to worry about what somebody's saying online or whatever pressure you've got in life so you handle it better but for me obviously we spoke about Wim Hof and stuff earlier and he changed the game. Mm. Obviously, the breathing techniques and nice exposure has been here for hundreds of thousands of years. Obviously, people are putting their own spin to it. And mm. I know a lot of boys in Glasgow and girls who are doing, who are battling with addictions who do the cold water stuff. I think there's a 30-day challenge there from people that were doing it every day. Sure, yeah. And the amazing feeling after it is, is second to mm. none. What about Eddie Hall? How much has he played a massive part in your success? He's... I, I, I look to successful people, so Eddie's, Eddie's the most... Him and Brian Shaw probably, but certainly the UK, Eddie is the most successful strongman. So if you're looking for a blueprint, Eddie Hall's that. You know, Eddie Hall, he's, I was saying to you earlier on, you know, we went down to see Eddie last year and we're driving around looking for his house and we parked at this big mansion, phoned him, right, mate, we're outside some big house. It's, don't know if it's yours or not. He's looking at the window, hi, it's mine. And it was just like the biggest house in the estate, man, it was stunning. And But Eddie's given us that kind of, that path to kind of follow. You know, obviously we're taking our own path, our own journey, but he's kind of paved that way. He's that kind of, that um, the first person, you know, to kind of be that new age, successful strongman in the UK. And he's, you talk about changing the game, Eddie's changed the game massively, man. He's just such a, such a smart, switched on guy, you know, and, and, and his self-belief and his, realization of him of what he wanted to do you know we talked a bit about you know life and death basically and eddie was that he was like willing to risk everything to be the world's strongest man and then he's like right mm-hmm. that's me done that and now he switched to acting he's on tv he's youtube he's boxing doing boxing nah, yeah. he's just he's nailing yeah. it man everything he does yeah. just and that's the thing it's that even though you're, you're pushing yourself to the limits you know there's rewards mm. at the other side of that pain you know mm. there's rewards at the other side of that oh, misery yeah, and man, sacrifice definitely. and if you've had any opportunities to do it i'd imagine two strong brothers acting yet has that came yet no opportunities yet there's, there's been a few things kind of coming through but personally i i, I want us to finish strong mm-hmm. man this this you know if we went away and did other stuff it would be kind of unfinished, unfinished business yeah. with strong man. So you came too far. Yeah, we're we're on that cusp, and certainly Tom, you know, so that then takes a lot, a lot of energy and time as mm-hmm. well. You know, I've seen it like half four when mm-hmm. he did a lot of his that. Then his strong man suffered, you know, and mm-hmm. that's what I don't want that. And yeah. I mean, I think doing our own documentary and maybe people seeing that will then be like. Mm-hmm. Oh, these guys are good, you know. So because mm. then you've got follow opportunities. It's more sponsors. How do you deal with the business side of things? Probably Is that difficult? Or do you? Uh-huh. Tom doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 just so like like the career I had before. I was more in engineering, you know. So it didn't really. I wasn't 
prepared for anything, you know. So we, we've now got our own merchandise company, YouTube, Jam, uh, meal preps, all these kind of things that are coming. It's all it's all very new, so it's quite challenging to, you know, we're reading contracts and we're like, oh, we can't sign that because it's full exclusivity. We can't have that. And like, going back to the guys without, um, I don't like to. I don't like to get into like ah uh, kind of heated debate and I don't like that. Yeah, you know, drama, I, with yeah. That. I feel like like anxious and stuff. You know when you you've got to kind of phone someone and say, look, I don't think we can sign this, or mm -hmm. we, I don't want to do this. It's, Feel as if you're letting them down. Yeah, and I get all anxiety and stuff. I don't like it, but then I'm like, well, I have to do it because that's part of business now, isn't it? It's like I've got to have, we've got to have, have to have these awkward conversations and. And you should realise that it is just business. You're not offending anyone. You know, it's like if someone didn't want to buy any of our merchandise, it's not like a direct attack on us. It's just that's what it is. Where can people buy your merchandise so we can give it a plug? Oh, uh, stoltmanbrothers.com. Send me the link. I can put it yeah, in the description. Was awesome. it cool. t-shirts, hats? T-shirts, hats, hoodies, socks. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing tracksuits soon. You know that'll go through the roof if somebody brings home a world title, isn't oh, it? Oh, well, he's got a it's, gone, uh, it's gone through the roof right now. Yeah, is it? Jesus, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh -huh. it's, like, it's, it's funny, yeah. Why do you think it's so popular, Strongmen? Well, it's a massive event worldwide that it is watched globally. Yeah, I think in the UK, for it's like the working class can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's attainable. I think people see it as like, well, like Eddie Hall, he was like a truck mechanic, uh, you know, it's it, you don't have to be this. Um, I don't know. You don't have to be this kind of elitist looking athlete. You know, mm -hmm. you don't. You get guys with big beer guts going in, giving it a go, and you know, it's all different shapes and sizes, and it's more catered to the the bigger gentleman, should we say? Yeah. Um, so it's it's maybe more attainable, and and people, I think, with that working class ethic whatever or mental background you know really seem to buy into that mm -hmm. and kind of it's mental the fans are so supportive like it's, yeah. it's just it seems like a good day out oh it's brilliant oh, yeah. it's, it, yeah. put it in strong as man's probably the best day out you'll is get that, it's class well, it's, we've actually got a show in Glasgow coming up in October so um, where's that it's in the SEC. Oh, the SEC. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll come along, oh, man. Yeah, we cool, get to see you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, actually, it's, but people get so amped up, man. Mm -hmm. It's like, you hear people screaming for you and it's just incredible. It's, I, I was, I, think I, I always rip my t-shirt off and throw it to the crowd. And, <laughs> and just showboating, but there was a, like an, an old man, he, he had it, I think he was in a wheelchair and this woman went to grab it off him. She must've been pissed up. But I think he was like, it must have been about 60 odd, mm -hmm. and this wife, he kind of grabbed it and she ripped it in half. And like, it was like, Jesus, violent sometimes, like some of the people, but it's, I don't know why people like it. It's just, and maybe people can just appreciate it. It's entertaining as well. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think people appreciate what we put our body through. Mm -hmm. and it's not, it's like watching guys lift cars, you're like, that's mm. cool, you know. So I think it's. Cool trucks and aeroplanes. Yeah, it is yeah. mad, though, what the yeah. body can do. How do you deal with injuries? Yeah, it's touch would have actually not had <laughs> anything yeah. so it's uh but i think it, it will mentally i think play on you i mean yeah. i've had a few niggles and stuff but uh for me i kind of just fight through it you know if you tear your quad you can still train your upper body stuff you know you just have to be smart about it but um i think nowadays there's a lot of physios and a lot of help you can get with the hip injuries but yeah. more prevention yeah, isn't it injury. Not had any no it's more injury so, prevention I think mm -hmm. that's what we look to do so that's yeah. like we've got our physios, physios that we see kind of two times a week do you do a lot of stretching or anything no I'm not no, no I don't no. No. like I, was, I, I did a bit of yoga a couple of classes and the yoga instructor said for us what we do if we become too loose it's actually easier to make injury yeah that's yeah, yeah. it's detrimental to our mm -hmm. training so like we stretch in the sense that, like say if we're squatting, we'll kind of warm up our legs and kind of do a bit of kind of mobility work there, but not when you see other athletes stretch. It's not as as a as a necessity. I wouldn't see it in strongman. Yeah, it must uh, be hard for athletes though to be doing the strongman planned all year for it, working hard, and then maybe get an injury first event. Have you seen that? Yeah, oh, it's one of the worst. Who's got psychologists at the side or anything? It, no, no, it's 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 uh, mm, yeah the injuries. That's the worst one. Seen 
uh, Giant Slide, there was a guy called Phil Roberts on the Atlas Stones. He, uh, I think, missed the platform. It came back and snapped his leg in half. And I was like, I can't do Atlas Stones. And he had a big cha- uh, cage over his leg and was out. But that was like, you, you see it on the, t- you see it in like Facebook and Instagram and stuff. But then to see it in, Real life, you're like, nah, this is <laughs> like, I, oh, it's I, you can hear it. So, say when you tear like a peck or a mm, bicep, you, you hear just it, hear it crack, like it's like Velcro. I just like it. went the wrong way, so it was, and that's that's tough, you know, when you see it, like maybe I maybe we should see sports psychiatrist and uh-huh. stuff and have a chat about it because it's it does play in your mind. But I think, I don't know, for, for me, like if I'm training, I got to train everything in my body. So all my small muscle groups need to be strong. My big muscle groups need to be strong. And in my head, as long as I know I've done that, that, again, we said injury prevention, that prevents injury. So I think a lot of guys come in and they get strong really quickly. They don't maybe, they, they kind of forget about the smaller muscle groups, the so, uh, assisted muscle groups, and they don't train them as much. And that's when the bigger muscles, your quads, your pecs, your whatever else will tear because the supporting muscle groups aren't as strong. So there's a lot of science behind it as well. It's not just a case of lifting heavy no, weights. There's so much yeah. more to it than people think. Very much, yeah. Certainly in, in now, nowadays, back when like Big Jeff and, you know, uh, John Paul and all that, you know, they were competing. It was more of like a, a gung-ho kind of just get stuck in and there wasn't as much research or the, the recovery wasn't there, the, the science mind that wasn't there. I mean, we have nutritionists, we have physios, chiropractors, acupuncture, um, hot and cold, you know, everything's geared towards being the best athlete mm-hmm. we can. How is it between that strong men and like Mr. Universes? Is there a competition? Is there respect there? Or how do they treat his because like Arnie and that and all that kind of how like the I think the Arnie league. loves it. Arnie Arnie's mm-hmm. a huge fan yeah, of he loves it. He's, he's, um, so we haven't actually met Arnold yet, but he's we're doing a Arnold uh, competition, so an expo, Arnold's uh-huh. expo in oh, in the UK sometime this year. So he's going to come over. So hopefully we'll get the crack with him then. Well, the class. But he loves it. He, he loves his strength because I think he just when he when he was coming up through his bodybuilding career, you know, obviously bench pressing, whatever, deadlifting. He knows he's got a, an appreciation of it. Mm-hmm. But with like a lot of the kind of Mr. Universe, the bodybuilding, you know, it's it's so kind of <clears throat> it's so alien, you know. They there was a there was quite a funny photo with uh, Brian Shaw, Eddie Hall, and Jay Cutler, Cutler. Mm-hmm. and the main Jay Cutler looks honestly, it's tiny. Jay, yeah, does he, yeah. it's, Jay's a big boy, like, uh-huh. but like when you've got a four hundred pound, couple of four hundred pound mm-hmm. monsters to next year. Mm-hmm. You just it's totally caught. night and day, totally different. Yeah, yeah. But I, would imagine, I don't, I didn't know if there was rivalry between it and or. Not really, no. I, I mean, not, people reach out, bodybuilders reach out to like me on like socials and stuff, mm. and you see a lot more kind of fitness models and bodybuilders adding some strongman compounds mm. into it mm. because it's a bit of fun, you know. So. Well, CrossFit's next level. Yeah, CrossFit. You want your, your mindset, good yeah, man, go and do CrossFit. Razor, do you know what I mean? It ain't fucking about it. Yeah, it's not that. Like, I can go to the gym and I just pose up, walk about. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do fuck all, but when I'm in CrossFit, well, you're a different animal. Oh, your geez. ego's left at the door. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. become totally vulnerable to whatever's going on and everybody just works their asses oh, off. Class, man, do you know what I mean? So, going forward for the future, lads, what's your plans, first of all, will you look? Yeah, so just push on. I, podium at World Strongest Man. Um, that's my goal, This certainly this year. Um, and I'm kind of changing now. I'm wanting to keep competing in Strongman and winning the shows and stuff, but grow the business. You know, that's that's what's getting me excited now is seeing the business grow and, and kind of do more with the, the mental health. I'm an ambassador up in, in the Highlands, Mikey's line. Um, it's a charity for mental health, so I'm wanting to do more keep promoting like cold water the benefits of it cold water immersion therapy and get people just realizing that you know you can battle it you can be okay you know it's we we talk a lot about it's okay to not be okay and i I do understand that but in the same time it's not you know we need to do more to to make people okay you know we it's it's for me it's i feel it's my responsibility to make sure people are okay you know it's not just a, a tagline that we say it's it's taking the time to kind of speak to people and kind of I really want to do more um, more with that because it's, it's it kills me man it's 
some of the stories you hear, man, it's like just it really gets me. So I just want to help more with that, grow the business, win world's strongest man, be a Hollywood movie star. And yeah, apart from that. But you know what? You're on course for it. <laughs> You're on course for it. And like that tagline, it's okay not to be okay. I'm the same. It, it's true, but you don't need to fucking live there. Yeah. Don't just sit there for five years and 10 years because people use that slogan. Man, get off your ass. Get out of fresh air. No yep. matter what weight you are, what height you are, get out. Get some fresh air, get some nature, switch off your phone, Definitely. connect, and you will gradually start feeling better. What about yourself, Tom? Yeah, so, well, obviously strong, but I want to be a positive role model for everyone with autism. I mean, for me, that's, since I started the sport and started gradually getting better, I've always wanted that. I mean, the amount of messages I get from, like, younger kids and their mums saying, like, you're changing people's lives just for lifting weights and being on YouTube, um, and, like getting people to like, I mean, I've had kids that wouldn't talk to now talking and like opening up to people, which is, you know, from just lifting weights and expressing myself on YouTube, you're like, geez, that's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So for me, that means more than anything than winning like titles, but obviously winning World's Strongest Man uh, is a massive goal as well. And then growing the business with Luke, you know, it's, I want like us to kind of take over the UK, take over the world and, uh, win, uh, win mm. world five or six times but also just get our name and our brand like to the top of the sport and mm -hmm. make everybody know that like we're the Stoltmans and you know we're here we're to here take to over fucking stay in love, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but yeah that's just you know that's big goals and they're going to get smashed but yeah I'm starting to look in the business stuff as well you know obviously you can't do strongman for the rest of my life and I don't want to do it till I'm 40 I want to like be done with this sport quick I want to win worlds and then go on a different path, you know, maybe get into the art dean and just traveling the world. You know, I love traveling the world. I love all that kind of lifestyle. So I just want to do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, so. I think it's phenomenal, guys, for what he's achieving. He's a very nice guy. He's probably two of the nicest guys I've ever met. For, sure. for what he's going to achieve, somebody will bring the world title home this, this year, I believe. And I'll have his back on with the throw. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to fucking get knocked out, mate. So I'll just let his views fight that out in a day. Um, for what he's doing for pushing forward, Tom, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Your mum will be proud. Appreciate Amazing that. effort for Appreciate the trophies that you've won, for what you're doing for mental health. It's fucking unbelievable. You should be proud, lads. And for coming on today and Cheers telling your story, I genuinely much, appreciate man. it. You, God bless for the future. Cheers. Check out more of my podcasts on the right. And be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.